Good morning, Reflection Church. Will you stand up with us and worship God together?
power yours is a glory forever amen yours is a kingdom yours is a power yours is a glory forever amen yours is a kingdom yours is a power yours is a glory forever amen yours is a kingdom yours is a power yours is a glory
The Bible says that uh, in Luke chapter 24, there were two disciples on the road to Emmaus and the resurrected Jesus appeared before them. And when he did, and when he began to speak to them and talk to them, their hearts started burning. There was something in their inner world that started shaking. There was something that started taking place. When that happened, they said, we want you to stay. We don't want you to keep walking. We want you to come, come to our house, come and stay with us. When they did, they got to the table. And when they got to the table, something changed. They went from being the hosts to being the guests. Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it as he always did before. And when he did that, their eyes were open. And they said, did not our hearts burn within when he spoke about himself concerning the scriptures? This is the reality around the table of the Lord that we seek to experience. That when we get around the table today, when we come to his glorious table, that in his presence, by the Spirit of God, that he would reveal himself to us and open his heart to us, heal us, set us free, make us whole, and make us new. So before we start and begin this process of getting around the table of the Lord, I want us to just, if you would, just close your eyes. And the Bible says not to partake in a manner unworthy. Let's just take a moment here and let's just, in this atmosphere, let's just allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, to make us new. Just begin to ask him, Lord, are there any areas in my life that are out of alignment with you? Come and search us, Lord. Come and search us, Lord. The Bible says if you confess those things that he's revealed, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So right now, let's just ask for the cleansing flow of the blood of Jesus to wash over our hearts. Wash over our minds, Lord. Forgive us. Renew us. Make us new in your presence. Make us new, Lord. I'm going to ask at this time if our Eucharist servers would come. And the way we do Eucharist, communion, the Lord's table, whatever verbiage you're familiar with, we only have one stipulation, and that's that we ask that you have saving faith in the Lord Jesus to partake at the table. What's going to happen? One on these two sections, in these two sections, we have ushers who are going to dismiss you here in a moment. Not, not quite yet, but here in a moment. And when they do, if you're on these two sections, you'll come to Elder Gary and Miss Anna. And on this side, you'll come to the Carters if you're over here. And what they're going to do, they're going to hand you a piece of the bread. You'll take that. And then they'll come around and, and allow the cup to be there. And you're just going to take the bread and just gently dip the bread into the cup. So for those of you worried about all drinking from the same cup, don't worry. We're not going to do that. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, you'll just take a piece and you'll gently dip into the cup and then you'll eat immediately. Then stay and they're going to pray a prayer of blessing over you. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke the bread. He said, this is the bread of my body. Today when we come to the table and we take the bread of his body, we're receiving the bread that comes down from heaven according to John chapter 6. We're receiving everlasting and eternal bread. We're receiving a bread that never grows old, that never runs out, that if you eat of it, it will never stop nourishing you. It will, if you feed on this bread, 
you will live forever, Jesus said. And in like manner, he took a cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. And it represents new promises, a new binding agreement between the Father and humanity that all who would receive what I've done through my body and my blood, you would experience these covenant benefits. So today, Lord, we thank you for your body that was broken, that was marred beyond recognition, that was bruised, that was disfigured, that you did not take a form that had any type of nobility or anything that would cause people to look at you, but you took on the form of a slave and humbled yourself to death, even death on a cross. And because of that, your name has been highly exalted so that in the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess to the glory of the Father that Jesus is Lord. So we thank you for your body. We thank you today for your blood, the blood of Jesus that is sufficient for the forgiveness of sins, the blood of Jesus that is sufficient to take away sin's power, the blood of Jesus that removes sin's stains and the grip of sin, the blood of Jesus that takes away sickness, the blood of Jesus that breaks every curse, that breaks every stronghold, that breaks every bondage and addiction, Lord. We receive by faith today your body and blood and believe for mighty encounters in your presence. At this time, you can, ushers can dismiss the rose to come and partake.
Let's just sing this together, church. Jesus said this in Revelation 2. Remember, therefore, the love that you had at first and look at from where you've fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. First love is something that can grow cold. It's something that can wane that we have to repent of and stir up afresh, stir up anew. So just in your seats right now, just ask the Lord, give me that first love. Give me that first passion. Give me that first desire for you and for your presence. Lord, we thank you for first love that's being restored in our hearts and in our lives. Do it in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? At this time, our elementary age students are dismissed. You can follow Miss Judy, who's walking to the door to the back, and she will take you right to the room there. Grateful for you being with us today. Grateful for a new year in the presence of God. There's no better way to start a new year than today, making that commitment and that consecration. Uh, if you are new or you're newer here, take a moment, fill out the connect card in the seat back in front of you. And then feel free to just take that by the new here table in the lobby on your way out. We'll give you a gift as our way of saying thank you for being our guest today. Let us just, in this atmosphere of worship, worship the Lord with our giving. There are a number of ways you can do that that are on the screen behind me. If you are giving via cash or check, just take a giving envelope in the row in front of you and denote what fund or what the money is for, if it's tithe, if it's offering, whatever the case may be. And then you can drop it by this plate, by the double doors on your way out today. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the privilege and the opportunity that we have to return what belongs to you back to you in the covenant of tithe, giving of our first fruits, the tenth, the first, the best, Lord. Take it, use it, multiply it, Work your purposes in this city, in this region, in this nation, and all over the world. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Let me give you just a few announcements before I dive into this new series that we're starting. I have things written down so that I won't forget because I'm the world's worst at names and dates. Anything else, great at memorizing. You and I, Tom, were talking about this. Anything else but uh, names and dates, they just... So if you have that problem, our app has all of the dates for all of our events, our website, you can find that there. Let me just mention a couple that are on the horizon. The first is next Sunday, we're having Reverend Lee Grady come and be with us. Uh, Lee is a dear, dear friend of mine. He's a father to me in the faith um, and just an incredible prophet to the body of Christ. An incredible man of God. We've known each other for about, it's hard to believe, it's been eight or nine years now. And he officiated the wedding between me and Tiffany. And has just been to several nations together in ministry. And so to have him come and be with us, he was here last year. But some of you weren't here at the church yet, so this will be new for you. But he's going to come and, and minister to us about the Holy Spirit's role in our prayer life. And, and he's going to do some prophetic ministry over individuals. And it's going to be so encouraging to your heart and to your life. So I'm inviting you to be present for that. You really, really don't want to miss what the Lord is doing. I've been praying into this and believe that, that many of us will receive words from God that will really mark this year and will really be foundational to this year with God that is ahead. So that's the first thing. Next Sunday, 
10 a.m., Reverend Lee Grady is going to be with us. Then we have the 2024 Prayer Summit on Saturday, January the 27th. Saturday, January 27th. This is one of those events that I say if you call Reflection Church home, if you feel God uh, bringing you here like you're a part, that you feel this is your home church, this is one of those events that I that I give like a level 10 out of 10 importance because what we do at this prayer summit is not have a prayer seminar. We've done a lot of teaching in the body of Christ on prayer, but rarely do we actually gather to pray. And so what happens during the prayer summit is you are going to get equipped with about 15 or 20 different ways that you can pray and we're actually gonna practice those things and do those things and normally what happens, you're like, how in the world? I've never prayed for more than two minutes. How am I going to be here for three hours? I promise you, by the end of it, normally we can't get people out. I'm like, hey, it's, it's, it's time. It's time. I got to go. But it, it's such a glorious time in the presence of the Lord. And I really want you to be present for that. So beginning that following week, we have our prayer groups, our prayer connect groups that will begin on January the 29th, there should be a slide for that, I think, unless I, oh yes. January 29th through March 23rd. We've decided to cut our groups from 12 weeks to eight weeks because people stop coming after eight weeks. So, so anyway, we hear you and we have adjusted to that. So we have three rounds in 2024 of eight week connect groups, the spring, the summer, and the fall. So this is going to be a time where we get in homes together and we get around the Word of God and prayer together and eat together and build relationships and really grow in what it means to develop a life full of prayer. Let me tell you two other things. I don't have, I have slides for one of these, but not the other one. We have our harp and bowl service every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Harp and bowl is a prayer and worship service. The model comes from Revelation chapter 5. I'm not going to give the full explanation there. You'll come, come Wednesday and you'll find out. But it is a dynamic time in the spirit together where we flow in the presence of God, where we prophesy and exercise gifts of the Holy Spirit and get in the Word of God together and pray the Word. It's such a, such a wonderful time. It's one of my favorite things I get to do. Final thing. And I worked on this because in, in uh, our VIP meeting in the morning, I said final thing about four times. So I'm trying to be more truthful in the service. I got out all my exaggerations for our volunteers and leaders. So final thing is during the month of January, we're going to have what, what we're calling pop-up prayers. Pop-up prayers. That means that if you have our app, and you have in your settings the ability to receive notifications, you're gonna get like a little push notification just like you would from Facebook or your news outlet or whatever else. And it'll, it'll give a little alert real quick and tell you, hey, tomorrow morning, 6 a.m., we're gonna have prayer. Tomorrow night at, at 7 p.m., we're gonna pray together. These pop-up prayers are, are gonna happen at least once a week during January outside of the normal Sunday and Wednesday gathering. And the point is not to have as many people as we possibly can, although that's great. We're going to meet in our prayer room. If you don't know where that is, just meet me after service and we'll talk about it. But we're going to meet in our prayer room when that happens. And we're just going to gather whoever comes and just pray. Hey, maybe you come for 10 minutes. Great. Maybe you're able to swing by if it's early before work and you come for five minutes. Fantastic. Don't feel obliged to feel like, oh, if I come to this, I'm going to have to stay for hours at a time or anything like that. Uh, th there'll probably be no more than an hour, sometimes maybe half an hour, whatever, with no agenda other than Jesus. Just to gather, to get in the Word and pray the Word, to listen to what the Spirit is leading and guiding us to pray about. And it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time in His presence. So I'm, I'm excited about all those things that are happening in our church. Uh, I'm, I'm beginning a new series today. I don't know how long it's going to last. Might be January, might be March. I don't know. But I just feel the leading of the Spirit in this. And, and the series is called Developing a Life of Prayer. Developing a Life of Prayer. Now, developing a life of prayer is different than developing a prayer life. 
Anyone can carve out 10 minutes, read a devotional, and recite the Lord's Prayer with discipline and creating a habit. I'm talking about God developing in us a life that is totally consumed by prayer. This is what the Apostle Paul hinted at when he said, pray without ceasing. That does not mean that we walk around like this all day. But it does mean that our hearts are postured to hear heaven, to hear what God is saying, to listen to him, to speak with him, and to keep the pipeline of communication clear with God all day, every day, 24-7. That's what I'm after and feel like God has assigned me to in developing a life of prayer. So I want you to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 5, verse 3. Psalm chapter 5, verse 3. And what, what I figured since this is the first day, Lucky, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do something here. I'm scaring people now online. People can't see me anymore. I'm still here. I haven't been translated. I, I'm, I'm going to keep my word here. I thought this would be a nice little gesture since I said if everybody would bring their Bibles. <laughs> I said this year I want hard copy Bibles broken, tattered, shattered, coffee stained, tears, snot, notebook, notes, pens, highlighters, and I'll be the first to do that for us. Does that make anybody happy in the house today? Come on. So I said, if I start seeing hard copies, I'll turn it up. Okay. Psalm chapter five, verse three. This is one of my favorite passages in the collection of psalms and this psalm is such a gift in my life i want to open this present with you today from psalm chapter 5 verse 3 i've only got one translation on the screen and that's by design i'm going to read the other two though you you can leave this one up while i do but the it, I'm, I'm reading from the esv psalm chapter 5 verse 3 oh lord in the morning you hear my voice in the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you, and I watch. Oh, Lord, in the morning, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you, and you watch. Let me share two other translations. Now, the first one that I'm going to read from, I don't, I don't normally use these two. These are not my primary. My primary translation is the ESV, as it is a closer to a word-for-word -word translation from the original Hebrew and Greek. But the second translation I'm going to read through is what's called a paraphrase. It's the Message Bible uh, penned by Eugene Peterson, dear pastor who's with the Lord now. But the, these, this message translation here attempts to communicate in this verse specifically the thought behind the Hebrew term. There is some emotion. There is some connection that in a stiff word-for-word -word translation you don't quite see. I want to read this to you, then I'm going to read one more. Psalm 5-3 from the message. Every morning you'll hear me at it again. Don't you like that? Every morning you're going to hear me at it again. Every morning I lay out the pieces of my life on your altar and watch for your fire to descend. I'm going to get into why that's accurate. Let me read one more from the Passion Translation from Dr. Simmons. This one does the same thing as the message at attempting to communicate the heart behind a couple of these Hebrew terms that the English cognate or word that matches it is very simplistic, but the depth of knowledge behind the word is very expansive. Psalm 5.3, at each and every sunrise, you will hear my voice as I prepare my sacrifice of prayer to you. Every morning I lay out the pieces of my life on the altar and wait for your fire to fall upon my heart. I want to speak to you today from this subject, the key of the day. The key of the day. You can't have a life of prayer if you don't have a morning of prayer. A life of prayer has to have a beginning point. 
And the location of Psalm 5 is significant. Psalm 3 is a morning prayer. Psalm 4 is an evening prayer. Psalm 5 is a morning prayer. As to signify that your life and my life needs to be covered from morning to evening with prayer. Morning and evening with prayer. Charles Spurgeon, 19th century prince of preachers, said this, prayer should be the key of the day. That's the phrase where I got this title from. Prayer should be the key of the day and the lock of the night. That's powerful, isn't it? Prayer should be the key of the day and the lock of the night. Devotion should be both the morning and the evening star. These times where we get away with God and and where we invest time with him. Time with God is never spent. It's always invested. Spending indicates a loss. Investment indicates a gain. Every time we're with God, we're not spending time. We're investing it. You're building a history with God. You're creating a history with him where you're building relational capital, where you're developing friendship. How do you develop friendship in the natural? By investing time with with each other. That's how you do it. In the same way, this principle is of the spirit because God is not just looking for followers but friends. Up to this point, Jesus said in, in John chapter 13 through 17, hey, you, you, you've been called this, but now I call you my friends. There's a shift that happens in the secret place when we get alone with God and invest time with him where the rules and regulation and religious stipulation and I got to recite this and I got to read this in order to finish this in one year and I got to do that and that begins to melt away and friendship starts to happen. This is what God wants with us. He wants fellowship with us and communion, not religious performance. If you read the Bible through in a year but never let the Bible read you, then you've done a religious act. But it's not a transformative act to the heart. This is precisely the predicament of the religious leaders that they got into is they were great at keeping the letter of the law but missed the spirit. And God has come to Reveal to us in the ministry of Jesus, and I believe here in Psalm chapter 5, verse 3, how we begin cultivating a life of prayer. So I'm just going to walk through this passage, and we're going to dive into it and see what the Holy Spirit wants to teach us. Let's look again in verse 3. Oh, Lord, in the morning, you'll hear my voice, voice in the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. I want you to write this down, consistency in prayer. Consistency in prayer. Thank you so much, Lord. That was talent. I'd have spilt half this on the, I left my water and then I got in the cage, played drums and thought, oh no, I'm in need and lucky knows my heart. So thank you so much for that. Consistency in prayer. There is a repetitive phrase here in in the ESV, which I am reading from here in the morning, oh Lord, in the morning. In the morning, in the morning. When you see repetition, look closely because something significant is being communicated. In the morning, repeated, means that there is a daily rhythm. There is a, there is a system in place that David had to invest time with God. And this idea carries two concepts. Number one, as soon as it's morning, meaning the shifting from when, when night becomes day, the dawn, as soon as it's morning. That Hebrew term, in the morning, means as soon as it's morning. That means that's before many will wake up. Where am I late sleep in, folks? Okay, I see you. Where are my early risers? Okay, then this message is going to, I'm an early bird too. I'm a, I'm a night owl and an early bird. I tell, I, the two are not always best friends. Rama has taught me to enjoy sleeping. That's my one 14-month-old daughter. And she sleeps amazing. She sleeps from 7 to 7 every night, 12 hours. It's incredible. She is God's gift to my life. And Tiffany, my wife, taught me the, the blessing of sleep. I, you know, I, I always like to go to bed together, not her go to bed, and then me come in two hours later. So anyway, I, I started laying in bed, and it was dark. I'm like, this is kind of comfortable. I might just fall asleep. So my bedtime keeps creeping back and back and back. And now I'm, uh, 
no, I'm, I, don't, I can't say I'm a night owl anymore. I'm, I'm weak when it's night. I start getting tired too, too quick. If anything's on, I'm asleep. So I'm changing. So now I'm just an early morning person. Number one, as soon as it's morning. And number two, every morning. That's what this Hebrew term for in the morning. As soon as it's morning and every morning. Because consistency in prayer is the key that opens the door to fellowship and union with him. The message paraphrase that I read communicates the second idea, every morning, every morning. And the passion translation communicates the first idea, at each and every sunrise, at the turn of the morning and every morning, consistency. We can't pray once a week and expect to develop a meaningful life of prayer. And by prayer, I don't mean meals and bedtime. Lord, bless me, bless my family, help me, thanks, bye. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about fellowship with God, open Bible. Every time you get in the place of prayer, you should have an open Bible because this is the primary way God speaks to you. If you're looking for a word, there are 31,108 of them right here. I believe in the rhema word of God or the application of the logos, the written word to our hearts that is in season and present, but the, the, we can't divorce the two and just say, God, I want you to just tell me what to do and then never know or listen to his word. What I'm talking about is a fellowship where there's an open Bible and there's a journal and, and whatever, or a note, iPad, phone, note section, whatever, and you're just with God. You're saying, God, I'm here. I, I want to be with you. And you start praying Bible verses. Maybe you don't know what to pray, so you just open up Psalm 5, and you begin and say, oh, Lord, in the morning, in the morning, you hear my voice. God, I thank you that even though I'm, my eyes have crust on them and I'm mad about being up, that I'm here and you hear me. See, this verse becomes a springboard for conversation with God. You don't have to come up with all the verbiage. The verbiage is already here. One of the reasons we don't see prayers answered as often as we would like is because we don't pray promises. We pray personal preferences. When you pray promises, you get 100% success rate. I'm not saying that success rate means what you want, I'm saying what God desires. There is a 100% success rate when we pray promises back to God that he's given to us. So cultivating a life of prayer demands frequency. You gotta have some kind of stability and frequency. You can't show up Monday and then the next time you show up is a week later on the next Tuesday and expect to have a vibrant, tight-knit fellowship, close communion with God where you feel close with him, where you talk with him, where you interact with God. But each and every morning, I'm going to rise and talk to God. Consistency is the key. Now, some people say pick a time and let that be your time with the Lord. I'm a rebel with that. I'm a morning person. I say, no, do it in the morning. Give God that first portion. Go in the morning. Get up early. Wake up and get with God. I'm not trying to put these, uh, anything, uh, any kind of religious ritual on you. I'm just saying when you wake up, there's this desire to be with him before you go. Because we never have problems waking up and scrolling. Or at least I haven't. I never have problems checking the news, checking social, social media, looking at emails, responding to texts. But for some reason, there's so much resistance every time you say, I'm going to get up and do this. Because that's where friendship's cultivated. That's where desire is cultivated. That's where growth and transformation happens. And, and you, you get that cup of coffee for, where are my coffee drinkers at? I need, yes, double portion blessing on you. Everybody else, I'm praying for you. Deep intercessions, groanings too deep for words, according to Romans 8. So one of the things that you need to get very comfortable with is sometimes the problem is posture when you get up in the morning, and it's like, if I sit in that chair, I'm, I'm out, I'm asleep. Well, maybe you just need to stand up and pace. God, I'm here each and every morning. You hear my voice. I'm tired. 
I'm exhausted. I don't even know if I feel this yet. I don't know if I feel you. I don't even know if I can feel my legs yet, but I'm here. You're sipping coffee. You're drinking water. You're taking a tea. I don't know what you do. I'm here each and every morning. I'm here. I'm setting apart time to be with you. I don't know what you want to reveal, but I know it's worth my time. I know that you have treasures in your presence, pleasures that are greater than anything else I could experience. And if I just set aside this time, if I just get away with you, I'm going to hear you. And you start pacing. And you start changing your posture and you do something to maybe help you stay up. Isn't it interesting that we will verbally say in the body of Christ that we want to emulate the life of Jesus? I mean, I hope that myself and all of you would say that's the goal. I want to look like Jesus. That is the aim of being a Christian, a little Christ, is looking like him. Christ being formed in us. Us looking more and more and more like Jesus. It's interesting that we will emulate Jesus on most everything but prayer. I'm preaching to myself too, so don't feel attacked here. It's interesting that we will emulate Jesus' life in most things but prayer. One of the great keys that Jesus unlocked for us and has given to us is the key that opens the door of intimacy with the Father, which is prayer early in the morning. Mark was the first written gospel. And in the first chapter, you have Matthew and Mark, but Mark was written first. In the first chapter of the first written gospel, this is what the Bible says about Jesus' prayer life. In verses 35 through 37. And rising very early. Somebody say very early. And all the late night sleep or late morning folks just, just had a panic attack. And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark. That's fine in the winter when they, we have the time change and it's dark till 8 a.m. But, but Sometimes when the summer comes, that's, that's like 5 a.m. While, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and the disciples said, everybody's looking for you, and we're looking for you, and where are you, and why are you not available? We need you. Jesus said, I have to be with my father first. I can't do anything meaningful ministerially until I hear him. Jesus only did what the Father was doing and only said what the Father was saying. How do you think he heard what he was saying? He got out to a desert place, a desolate place, alone at 4 a.m. and said, I'm here. What do you want from me today? What city do I need to go to? What do I need to do? Who do you have for me to heal? What do you have for me to preach? This is where I believe the Sermon on the Mount was formed, in the desolate places. I don't think it was a spontaneous sermon where he just got up on a mountain and just started winging it from the hip. He got up and went to desolate places early in the morning. People wanted him, and he said, I want my father. I want time with my father. I want to be away with my father. I pray that's our heart. I pray that's our desire, consistently being with him. The Bible says in this Sermon on the Mount I referenced in Matthew chapter 6 that the Father actually dwells in the secret place. Where's God? I can't find him. I can't feel him. The God who dwells in secret is also the God who sees in secret. And if you go to the secret place, that's where he's at. Well, I can't find God in my life. I can't feel him anywhere. Get up early when it's dark. Get to a desolate place where there's no distraction. Maybe that's your kitchen. Maybe that's your closet in the bed. Maybe that's your living room. I don't, I don't care where it is. Get away with him and say, the Father who dwells in secret sees in secret, and I'm coming to the secret place. I'm not like the religious leaders. Jesus said, I don't want you to do that to only do public stuff where everybody thinks you're real close to me, but your private life and your inner world is, uh, is so filthy. I want you to go in secret, and that's where I'm at. We think that we go to find God. God's already there, and he's waiting to find us there. 
Well, I can't find God. God is looking for you. God is already in the secret place. If you want to know where to find him, steal away the God who dwells in the secret place. That's where he's at. You'll find him there. You may not have this revelatory experience every morning, and I can promise you most mornings will not be a burning bush moment in your life where you just have this crazy experience where your whole house starts shaking and something catches on fire and you feel angels' wings. But there's something there where God begins to speak to you and teach you and mold you and shape you. I was reminded when I was preparing this, when I thought about consistency in prayer Every morning, I remember when Rama was first born, and those first few weeks, uh, I, I've learned to sleep now from those first few weeks, but, but those first few weeks, I remember being so excited to be with her again. Because she slept most of the day. So like when she got up, she was up for an hour or so, and then she went back to sleep, and then she would eat and go back to sleep. And I remember I'd sit there and watch the monitor. Get up, get up, get up. I'm, I want to hang out. I want to I see you. I want to hold you. We'd waited for her for a while and been through a lot to get her. And when she was born, I just wanted to be with her. And I felt the Lord say, that's how I am in the secret place. I felt the Lord say, I'm, I'm there. And I'm like, I'm, I just want you here. I just, I just want to be with you. I don't want you to feel like, oh, i got to perform this. And if I haven't prayed an hour today, I'm a terrible Christian. And I'm the worst person ever. And I'm the, just get to the secret place. Just be with me. I'm, I'm waiting there for you. I want to be with you. I want to see you. I want to hear from you. I want to hear about your life. I want to hear what moves you. I want you to hear what moves me. I want to show you what I have for you. I want to explain some things about your life that are on the horizon. I want to reveal some things. I want to pour out my my love on you. Why do I say consistency in prayer early in the morning? Because just like I, I said in our giving, we give our first fruits. This is a principle in the kingdom of God, giving our best. Most of us at some point in our life, if we're honest, have given God our worst. Wave at me if you've ever given God your worst. Okay, we got some honest folks. Where you give him your leftovers. Where it's the last thought, oh, no, I forgot my Bible. I forgot to pray. I'll just throw up a quick Hail Mary and say the say Lord's Prayer or something real fast. And I'm good. Leftovers. Spiritual leftovers. And the shift that takes place in developing a life of prayer, and not just a prayer life where you create a habit for five minutes a day, the shift takes place when we understand the principle of first fruits. When we say, God, I'm giving you the best part of my day. I'm giving you the first part of my day. And everything else for, through the rest of the day will be open because this is the key of life. It's going to be opened because of the first fruits that I've given to you. The rest of my day is blessed and made holy because of this. This is Romans eleven sixteen. If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. God, I'm going to give you the first and best part of my day, and I'm going to trust that what I invest there and what time I invest there, that you're going to bless the rest of my day with your presence, that I'm going to hear you, that I'm going to have an open line of communication, and that we're going to develop fellowship and communion and relationship together. Amen? The first fruits, consistency is key. I know some of you are like miserable right now at the thought of getting up. Uh, and, and doing anything else, and I, and I hear you, and I understand that not everybody is a morning person. I get that, but there's a spiritual principle here that I'm inviting you to experience. I believe that God has something very special for you in this month if you will try it for this month, if you will try setting a schedule, setting a time, setting a place, making the appointment, being there every day, saying, God, if, you know, 5 a.m., 6.30, 7.30, 8 a.m., whatever your early morning is, I'm putting that first, and I'm meeting you in my living room at 8 a.m. And come hell or high water, I don't care what happens, I am not missing this appointment with you. This is an investment with you, and I've got to get consistent and build that relational equity and capital. Here's what I promise you. The God who answers prayer is the one certain factor as the day begins. 
Everything else may be a variable in your life, but one thing is certain. The God who answers prayer will be there at the beginning with you. And when you go to the secret place, he will be there. You may not get goosebumps. You may not have some kind of wild, crazy encounter, but he will be there. And you keep showing up, and you keep showing up, and you keep showing up, and he will be there. Consistency each and every morning. The next revelation is that of sacrifice. Write this down. The sacrifice of prayer. The sacrifice of prayer. Y'all thought y'all were getting off easy with a one-sentence verse today. (laughs) The sacrifice of prayer. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you. I love what the Passion Translation does in underscoring this. It says, I prepare my sacrifice of prayer to you. Every morning I lay out the pieces of my life on the altar. Now this is an important term because this is the same term that's used in Leviticus. The same Hebrew term that describes the laying out of the pieces of wood for the morning offering of the lamb each morning. It's the same term. That's why the translation is, I I put out the sacrifice of prayer and the pieces of my heart on your altar and wait for your fire to fall. This is that same priestly term that was used in Leviticus to describe the laying of the pieces of wood, the, the sacrifice of the lamb, and the fire on the altar. It's the same term. Each and every morning... I'm going to lay out the pieces of my heart on your altar and wait for your fire to fall. The lamb was slain before sunrise. Each and every morning, and the the fragrance of these offerings would rise before and be fragrant to God each and every morning that the priests would offer. I'm grateful that because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we don't have to sacrifice animals anymore. He is the eternal Lamb of God that was slain, and His sacrifice is sufficient for every person, for all humankind, for all of human history to forgive sin, to take away the sting of sin, to take away death, to take away and break anything off of your life, and to bring you into a relationship with Him. I'm grateful for the blood of Jesus. I'm grateful that his sacrifice removed those early morning sacrifice because of what Christ has done. But because of what Christ has done, there's been a change. Can I teach some Bible here for a minute? Okay, I'm going to anyway, so just, just appease me here. There's a change that happened. In the Old Testament, there were priests and Levites. There were the tribe of the Levites from which the priests came, and they were responsible. They did not receive a portion of the land that was divvied up between the 12 tribes. Their portion was God. And the tithe came to support the ministry of the tabernacle, the temple, and the priests who did service unto God. That's where the church gets the model of having a building and tithe, and the people who are on staff being uh, receiving funding through the tithe that's given. It's a biblical model straight out of the Old Testament that moves into the New Testament. So if you're ever wondering about, why am I tithing? What's going on? Why, why am I doing this? There's a little backdrop for you. Now, in the New Covenant, there is no need for the tribe of the Levites because we're not needing the sacrifices and rituals that were in the Old Covenant. However, there are still priests and Levites in the New Covenant. You say, where do you get this? I'm going to give some Bible for it. 1 Peter chapter 2. This is, a, this is a famous passage that's used frequently. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 says that we are a royal priesthood. A priesthood. Let me tell you about what the Old Testament prophets prophesied about this and how the New Testament writers understood this. Isaiah 56, 6, write that down and you can look at it. Isaiah foresaw a time in Isaiah 56, 6 where non-Jewish people, that's you unless you're an ethnic Jew, and if you are an ethnic Jew, this includes you too. But in, in Isaiah 56, 6, is talking about Gentiles, non-Jewish people. That means if you're any other ethnicity than a Jewish individual, this is talking about you. 
there would be a time when they would bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him. They would attach themselves to God and provide ministry to God. In Ezekiel 44, 15, Ezekiel saw a restoration that would take place where they would come near to the Lord and minister to him. These people would bind themselves again to God just like the Levites and the priests would. In Acts chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, the early church modeled this. They gathered together and they fasted and prayed and ministered to God. And in their ministry to God, God spoke and said, Set apart for me Saul and Barnabas for the work that I have for them. And then out of ministry to God, there was mission. Because mission is not a detached appendage from ministry to God. Mission to the world and the mission of God flows and is directly tethered to ministry to God. Okay. So in 1 Peter 2, 9, Peter says, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. John says in Revelation 1, 6 that God has made us a kingdom of priests. A kingdom of priests. So now there's been a shift that's happened when we become a believer. You are what I call a New Testament priest and Levite. You're like, what in the world is happening? I've never heard this. Okay. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you had accepted his lordship in you, received his, his salvation and forgiveness, he has made you a kingdom of priests. You have become a New Testament priest or Levite who does not offer him what would be considered the sacrifices of lambs and burning of incense. You offer him the sacrifice of prayer. Each and every sunrise, I offer you the sacrifice of prayer. We don't need a lamb anymore. The lamb's been slain. So what do we give him as a New Testament priest and Levite? We're not sacrificing animals. We have become, Romans 12, 1 and 2, living sacrifices presented to the Lord. So the pieces of our heart are then laid out on God's altar through prayer and time with him and becomes the sacrifice that pleases God. It becomes a sacrifice of prayer in our lives that brings intimacy with him. So when you wake up in the morning, you're not just a banker. You're not just a teacher. You're not just an employee. You're not just a CEO. You're not just a student. You're not just a professional. You're not just a father. You're not just a mother. You're not just a husband. You're not just a wife. You're not just a son. You're not just a daughter. You're not just a friend. You are a New Testament Levite and priest. So when you wake up, you get up and say, I get to minister to God today. I have a calling on my life. You don't have to have a microphone and preach or start a church to minister to God. You just got to get an open Bible and get in the secret place and pour out the pieces of your heart on his altar and give him the sacrifice of prayer. And so every morning when you wake up, how do you stay consistent? How do you offer the sacrifice? You understand that this is your vocation. You don't, you don't miss your job because you don't feel like it. Or if you do, you take a sick day and let them know, or they call the police, and then they check if you're alive. Okay? So, so in the same way, this is our responsibility as a priest and Levi. This is our vocation. This is our calling. I get up, and I stand and minister before God. You know what Gabriel said when he came and spoke to Daniel? He said, I am Gabriel, and I stand before God. Yeah, Gabriel, but what do you do? I look. I stand. I look at him. I worship. Yeah, but you got all these powers and all these abilities, and what do you do? I stand. What do, you, what do you do? What do you do as a believer? I mean, I try to read my Bible occasionally and try to say a prayer. What do you do? My calling is a New Testament Levite and priest who ministers to the Lord, who gets up and lays out the pieces of my heart on his altar, who gives my heart on his altar and waits for his fire to fall on the heart. You get up, you're a New Testament priest and a Levite. Now, the sacrifice of Jesus enabled us, according to Hebrews 4.16, to enter that place boldly and with confidence. 
Not like, oh God, I'm not good enough. I know. No, you're not. I'm not either. That's why Jesus came. And because of what he's done, we are given access to come in. We are, we are given access to minister before God, to stand before him, to look at him. Yeah, but don't I have to like recite everybody's name and open up a phone book and pray over every single person in the whole world or I'm not good at praying? Maybe you just need to stand. Maybe you need to be still and know that I am God. Maybe you need to watch. Maybe you need to open up your Bible and slowly read one verse and start praying that. Your strength is made perfect in my weakness. Lord, I'm coming. I I, I don't have that many talents or skills. I, I feel weak in so many ways, but when I'm with you, when I'm with you, you give me strength to do everything you've called me to, and you'll always give me enough for what I need and what you're calling me to do. So I'm just going to look at you. I'm going to thank you. I'm going to be with you and listen, God. What, what is it that you want to say to me? What is it that you want to give me? What strength do you want to place in my life? The sacrifice of prayer. There's one final thing. I want you to write this down. Watchfulness in prayer. Watchfulness in prayer. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. And watch. This is what the entire Western world is terrible at, myself included. (laughs) Terrible watching. Understand that when Jesus taught prayer, he said, watch and pray. That signifies that those are two different things with a coordinating conjunction between them. Watching is something we do while we're praying. Each and every morning, I put out the pieces of my heart on your altar and and watch for your fire to fall. Watch. Did you know that this Hebrew term is the exact same term that I preached from last week from Habakkuk chapter 2 verses 1 through 4? Get to the watchtower. I will station myself at the watchtower and I will wait for your response. This is the exact same term that's being spoken of is waiting and watching and waiting and watching and praying and waiting and watching. Prayer is not primarily how many words can I fit in and sound good. How many phrases can I say to make God do what I want? He's not a genie in a bottle that we rub by saying certain phrases and he comes out and does what we want and then goes back in. If you viewed prayer as transactional, you've missed the point. It's got to be transformational. The aim is not getting and receiving a transaction. The reason prayer has become so boring in our world is because it's fix this. My knee hurts. My elbow's sore. I have a headache. Fix it. I mean, my goodness, there's so much. There's a whole world of prayer beyond that. Do we pray for needs? Yes. Do we believe that God answers and heals us physically? Yes. Do we pray about that and receive healing? Yes. But is there 98% more to prayer than that? Yes. And the reason people don't want to come to prayer meetings is because most of the time what they heard was this. I'm going to come back down. I don't like being out here. If it wasn't for the cameras, but... What they've heard is this. Somebody stands up and says, my, my second cousin is traveling, and I need traveling mercies. And they had this happen in their life, and this happened in their life. Then somebody volunteers to pray and says, Lord, we pray for this person for traveling mercies. And they pray what was just said. And then the next person says, and by the third or fourth person, everybody's disengaged. Can we just be honest enough in this moment to say that those prayer meetings that have primarily been describing needs and praying for three minutes out of the hour because 57 minutes have been telling the life story of what's happening in this, do y'all understand? Maybe I'm the only person who's, maybe y'all haven't been in a prayer meeting before, but, um, but that, that has soiled in many ways the reputation of what God's intent is for corporate prayer. 
We definitely need systems in place to receive needs and requests. And we make known our requests to God and to one another to receive that healing. I'm not against that. Don't misunderstand me. But what I'm saying is there is a world of prayer so far beyond that that this month we're going to get into. This prayer summit we're going to get into. Harp and bowls we're going to get into. There is an entire world of prayer that you may have never tapped or understood that God is inviting you into that he's bringing you into, that'll shake off the boredom of lists. This year, let's burn up the list. What I mean is, let's, you need to have some kind of list in prayer, something that kind of guides you. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying, let's burn up our only prayer being five needs a day. Let's do away with that model, and let's get in his presence. Let's behold him. Let's minister to him. Let's take an open Bible and start praying Bible verses. Let's hunger and thirst and be filled with righteousness. Let's just say, I'm just in your presence today. I'm not even going to talk about what my needs are because you're my greatest satisfaction. There are times every day where, go for it, tell them your needs. Receive that freedom, that healing, whatever. But not every time you pray needs to be need-based. Sometimes it just needs to be adoration. Lord, I love you. I'm grateful. How would your marriage be? Some of you are like, well, mine's this way because of this. How would it be if the only conversation you had was do this? I need you to do this. I need you to take out the trash. I need you to paint this wall. I need you to do the dishes. I need you to fold the laundry. I need you to cook dinner. I need this. I need you to go shopping. What if that was the only conversation you ever had with your spouse? Ever, I need, I need, I need. And never just, I'm so grateful to be with you. I'm so thankful I get to have this time with you. See, when we, when we understand watchfulness in prayer, and we say, I'm not just going to pray and leave and then shut off my spiritual life until 7 a.m. tomorrow, because that's the other religious system that can get created. We get real good at time with God, and then everything else is my time. I've got my 20 minutes of devotional, and that's God's. And then the next 23 hours and 40 minutes are mine to do whatever I want with. We're talking about developing a life of prayer. Not a prayer life, not a habit, not a 10-minute-a-day habit, but a life consumed with prayer with God, conversation with God, or that any moment of your day you could, you could move right into it, right into it. You're walking around the office. You can move right into it. You're driving in the car. You're there. You're, you're in the room with your family. You can move right into it. See, this also helps create strong families, strong life with God, because if you create an atmosphere in your life where at any moment you can move into prayer, that's going to eliminate a lot of things that get done. A lot of things of, should I do that? Should I watch that? Should we listen to this? Should we? Well, just think, does it facilitate an atmosphere where I can move right into prayer and not feel like I have to spend 30 minutes getting purged? I've went from preaching to meddling now. <laughs> so so this is, th these are the questions we have to ask ourselves in watching for prayer. I think of Elijah when he made sacrifices on Mount Carmel, and he waited and watched for fire to fall. He knew it was going to happen, but he waited. He didn't just say, well, I'm going to go on off the mountain, and you prophets watch as this happened. He said, no, I'm going, to, I'm going to be here and watch for this thing to happen too. Watchfulness in prayer. Just as fire ascended into heaven, the priests, they didn't just say, I'm just going to throw a match over by the altar and hope something happens. They watched and waited for the smoke to rise. So often in our prayer life, we say, well, God, fix this. All right, we'll see you. Well, I haven't been fixed. Okay, are you going to fix it yet? I'm tired of waiting. And we don't just watch. We don't just say, God, this is happening in my life. What do you want to say about it? I'm just going to watch. I'm just going to wait. I just want to see what you have to say about it. I remember as a kid, I used to watch, this is showing my age here. People say that as they get older, so I think I can say it now. Um, that was an attempt at humor, by the way. 
Sometimes it doesn't work, so I just call it a dad joke and just keep on going. When I was a kid, I would watch the weather forecast on the TV and see if we were having school because y'all never understand younger generations the joy of seeing that little ticker on the bottom of the screen come on and say, you don't have school. If you want to have a spiritual experience, you wait from 6 a.m. to 7 till that name of your school comes across the bottom of the screen and you take a lap around the house. So, so great experience. Now they have virtual school and everything. They just ruined snow days. Snow days were amazing. Uh, sorry, y'all never get to experience those kinds of things again. Um, I'll, we'll, we'll pray that God brings them back. How about that? All of us in, in past generations who experienced that, we'll pray for y'all. Um, I would, even when the snow was forecasted, I remember I'd get so excited as a kid. I'd, I'd go by the back double doors, the French doors there, and there were glass uh, square paned, and I would just sit there and watch. I would wait for that first drop of snow. I, I would be up at 2 a.m., and I'd sit there at the window till 5 a.m. and be praying, Lord, I'm exhausted. I can't go to school now. You got to send the snow. And I'd, be, I'd, I'd look at the TV and see, okay, it says the forecast is here. It's showing 90% precipitation. Nothing's happening. What's going on? What's happening? We're going to end up in school. I remember I'd watch and I'd watch and I'd watch, and then the first drop would come. That's how prayer life is like a lot. You spend a lot of time watching and waiting and looking and hoping and believing and standing in faith, and then the answer comes. It brings joy to your heart. It brings hope, watching and prayer. I want to tell just a few stories, some testimonies, and then I'm finished about watchfulness and prayer. I just poured half my water on me and on the floor. Nobody walk up here. It's slick. Um, I, prayer didn't come naturally for me. It wasn't easy. Reading the Bible was easy for me. I've always loved reading my Bible from a very young age. I've, I've always done it. I didn't always pray. Prayer was hard. The Bible was, it's like I, I could just connect with God. I'd be reading and there would be things that he was showing me and I'd get excited about it and I just, I love the word and memorizing it and I, I just, I loved and connected with God through the word. I, prayer was different. I like church services and I like when they would have altar ministry and people were praying, but me just praying alone, that was never easy. I did it, but it was short and I ran out of things. <laughs> Didn't come easy. When I was in Bible college, the Lord spoke to me about a coming revival that he wanted to send. And he said, what is your response going to be? If you believe I'm going to do this and I'm going to send this kind of move of the Holy Spirit in this land, what is your response going to be? And I thought about it all day. And I just toyed with what, what would I do? What, what should my response be? And I came to the conclusion, I'll pray. I know that sounds really basic, and it sounds like a cheap answer, but I, I, I deeply meant this. I'll, I'll, I'll pray. That's what I'm going to do. And I didn't just mean I'm just going to say a quick, Lord, thanks that you're doing something in our world. Amen. And so that night, I'm with my roommate. He's a ministry student as well. So I said, hey, and I know this might seem awkward, I know this hasn't happened before between us, but I said, it was 9 p.m., and I said, I just feel that God's spoken to me about this and that he's called me to pray, like seriously pray about this. And I said, in the living room, everybody was still out there, and campus was basically shut down at this time, and I just, I just said, hey, I'm, I'm planning to use this side of the room. I don't know if you have other plans or anything else, but if you want to join, you're welcome to join with me. We started praying, and we prayed for three hours. I've, I'd, I'd never prayed alone for more than 10 minutes in my life up to that point. And prayed for three hours. It felt like a moment. And that continued to happen, and more and more people started coming. And for between 60 to 90 days in a row, from 9 to 12, we ended up meeting in the prayer chapel every night. And 
And God started doing miracles on the campus where we would place our hands on broken bones and they'd start to move in our hands. People would start to get healed. Where entire sports teams were getting saved in one day. Where testimonies were flowing as strong and as fast as the rapids in a river. Where people were being baptized in the Holy Spirit and functioning in the gifts of the Holy Spirit that never had before, never even heard of it before. These were the things, and we would just get together and watch. We would pray, and then we would watch. And the things that God did in that season, anybody who was part of it can tell you how deeply their life was marked by that even today. And at that moment, God made me a man of prayer. I was never a man of prayer before that, but he did that in my heart. He changed me. I believe he can change you. Some of you are already at the mountain in prayer, but all of us always have room to grow. I watched, I watched, I watched, I watched. We prayed, and God did, and he did, and he did. On my ministry internship, the Lord gave me a lake house. I'm not joking. Most ministry interns were like in a little 300 square foot apartment, you know, a dorm. There was a person who was at the church who said God told them to give me the, their lake house. I had a lake house all to myself. You know how awesome that is as, an, as a 20 year old, just to be in a lake house with kayaks and boats and have access to it. And, and it, now it was winter when I got there, but by the time I ended, it was in April. And so for three months, here's the caveat. They didn't have TV. They didn't have have Wi-Fi. And they did not have cell service. You know what I did? I watched. I got out on the water. I talked and I watched and I waited. God started speaking to me. He showed me it's more than just saying and reciting needs. I want to reveal myself. I want to talk to you. Got to three months later to Regent University and the Holy Spirit started speaking about starting prayer gatherings. Are you seeing a theme emerging? It's like everywhere from that point forward, the Lord started calling me into this. We started gathering. Five of us would meet in my room and we'd just pray together and watch. God would speak words that would be lived out amongst us today that many of us who prayed together are still close and hear about all the things that God is doing that we prayed about five and six years ago that are coming to pass. We pray and we would watch. At New Life Church, the church that we were part of there, we had morning prayer, we had evening prayer, we had midday prayers, we had prayer, 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 we had all kinds of prayers, we had intercessory prayer, we had soaking prayer, we had watching prayer, we had waiting prayer, we had contemplative prayer, we had meditative prayer, 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 6,000 people, 1,000 come to a prayer meeting. Prayer. The spirit of prayer wants to grab hold of your life and God wants to pull you in. God wants to bring you into prayer. I'm not talking about a New Year's resolution. I'm not talking about a spiritual habit that you do for three weeks to feel good about your life with God. I'm talking about a life from this point forward consumed. Consumed with prayer. I believe that in the same way that God took my heart that was very apathetic toward prayer and set it on fire is the same turn he can make in your life that your prayer life would become a life of prayer. And it would not be a sectioned off 10 second, 10 minute quick need based prayer, but there would be a communion and a fellowship with God that would begin to emerge in your heart and in your life. This is what, this is the key right here. This is the key of your day of your life with God. Consistency, setting the time, setting the place, getting up each and every morning. When the morning comes, here I am. Maybe you're just walking around praying in tongues. Maybe you're just walking around praying, God help me, I don't even know what to pray. Maybe you're just walking around saying, I'm here. I'm here, here I am in the morning. Consistency. I'm telling you, when you offer that sacrifice before God, there will come a day where the fire will fall. 
It may not be the first day. It may not be the first month. It may not be the first year. There will come a time when the fire will fall on the pieces of your heart that you've laid out. You cannot give up. You cannot grow weary in doing good for in due season. If you have sown appropriately, you will reap. Let's stand together. Here's what I'm inviting you into. Two things. Number one, today after the service marks the beginning of the rest of the month, church-wide fast. I'm inviting you to fast. Fasting, we're going to talk about this some more in the weeks to come. Fasting is, is the, literally, it's the spark that ignites your prayer life. It's oxygen to the fire. It fans it into flame. It gives you focus. There are all kinds of fasts you can do. I'm not going to legislate what fast you do. It's between you and the Holy Spirit. But I am asking if you're physically able that you would make it food related. Every fast in the Bible was food related. I'm not saying that you shouldn't fast social media. Most of us probably need to. I'm not saying you can't fast other things, but I'm saying the early church fasted one day a week every week. Every week. This is in their historical documents. One day a week, every week. I mean, maybe you do one day a week. Maybe you do a meal a day where you just push away the plate and say, I don't, I'm not choosing the delicacies of earth. I'm choosing the delicacies of heaven. I have food you don't know about. Maybe you do three-day fast and then take a day or two and then a three-day fast. Maybe you do a seven-day fast. Maybe you do a 21-day Daniel fast. I don't, I'm not going to legislate what you do, but for the rest of the month, I'm inviting you to fast with me. I'm going to do it. I'm not asking you to do something I'm not going to do. This is not a health kick. This is not a diet starter. This is not a habit. This is a spiritual practice where we are going to get closer to God than we ever have before. We're not trying to earn God's approval by fasting. We're not going to try to bend his arm and twist it. We're going to empty ourselves so that we can be filled by him. We're going to get hungry so that we can get full. We've got to move into fasting and prayer like never before in this hour. And God has things in store for our church in the coming weeks and months that if he were to tell us, we would not believe it. It hinges on this moment. All it takes is unity in one accord. In the upper room, they were together, 120 of them in one accord. 120 people said, for 10 days straight, we're going to get into agreement together. I'm asking that we would get in one accord together on this and see what God does. If you say, I need, I need to consecrate this month, I'm going to fast, I'm going to see my life become a life of prayer. If you say, I want to make that commitment, I'm just inviting you forward and I'm going to pray a prayer of the grace of God to fast and the grace of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit to help you. So if you say, yeah, I'm going to fast and I'm going to seek God in making my life a life of prayer, I just want you to step forward and I want to pray over you grace and strength from God because you're not going to be able to do this in your own strength. You'll get weary, you'll burn out, by the end of the night, you'll be eating Snickers and Doritos. I promise. I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Say you're going to fast and then we're going to have grace. This is a grace-filled fast. We're going to trust the Spirit. We're going to rely on His strength. And we're going to let Him do His work in us. So I just want you to lift your hands to heaven right now. Lord, I'm praying that the grace of God would fall to fast right now and to seek and to pursue. That the grace to push away the plate, to choose heavenly things, to hunger and thirst for spiritual things, to hunger and thirst for the Word of God, the worship of God, prayer. Oh God, that you would create hunger pains, not for food, but for the Spirit. In the same way that our natural bodies indicate it's time to eat, 
tell our spirits it's time to eat. It's time to get in the word. It's time to get in prayer. It's time to sing to me. It's time to give thanks to me. It's time to worship me, Lord. Give us those signals, those, those spiritual awareness, God. Pray for spiritual stamina right now in the name of Jesus. That when the enemy would come and taunt and say, it's not doing anything, it's going to turn out the way the last time did, it's not going to work, you're not going to be able to do this, you're going to end up quitting anyway, so you might as well just go ahead and stop while you're ahead. I pray that the same strength that was in Jesus Christ in the desert would be the same strength in you. That man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And that the Word of God would dwell richly in you and strengthen you, gird you up, and be able to sustain you when you feel weak in your flesh. I pray that the Lord, in your time with Him, that you set aside the consistency that you get with Him, that He would just begin to pull you close. That He would begin to reveal His heart to you. That He would bring you in to the Father's love and grace and mercy. And that he would make you a man or a woman of prayer. That he would make you someone whose life would be marked by it. That prayer would be the inheritance that you leave for your children and your children's children and your children's children's children. That they would say, they might not have had much. They might not have had businesses and goals and dreams. and They might not have had a lot of money. They might not have been famous in the world's eyes, but in the halls of heaven, they were known. They were rich in faith. They were rich in prayer. They were rich in the Spirit. Lord, let that be our life's message and legacy. And so today, I bless you, all of you, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that from this day forward you will walk out in the grace and strength of the Lord Jesus, that his power would be upon you, that his presence would be upon you, that his glory would be upon you, that his strength would be upon you. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before his presence with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forevermore. Amen and 